So tonight I'd like to um, bring out a guest speaker uh, to begin with. Her name is Dana Rashid. She is a, an assistant research professor in cell biology and neurobiology. She works with Jack Horner and she's also on the Science on Screen Committee. So we would like to welcome, her nickname is the Dino Chick because she works on the chicken, the Dino Chick project with Jack Horner. So Dino Chick, Dana Rashid, come on out. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> I'll be forever known as a Dino Chick now. That's okay. Yeah, okay. There's worse nicknames than Dino Chick. So that's <laughs> a badge of honor. So. Well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for coming to Science on Screen presentation of Jurassic World with Jack Horner. Um, and besides thanking all of you, um, we also need to thank the people and organizations who um, made this happen. And so Science on Screen, see I, I wrote this out so I wouldn't forget it. Science on Screen is funded by the Coolidge Corner Foundation and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And this screening is in collaboration with the Children's Museum of Bozeman Steam Lab and the Blunderbuss Science and Maker Fair. And there will be a question and answer session after the movie, and everyone should stay, because it'll be awesome. Um, and of course, the question and answer is with our speaker, Jack Horner. Um, and Jack Horner is arguably the world's most famous paleontologist, and we have him right here in Bozeman. Um, and he actually, yay! Um, he makes a few appearances, cameo appearances in this movie, so he's not just a paleontologist, he's also a movie star. <laughs> um, and he's consultant on all the Jurassic Park movies, and I'm waiting for him to, end, to, to come out here. All right. He's consultant on all the Jurassic Park movies, but he's actually embarked on his own project to re-engineer ancestral dinosaur tra tra traits in a chicken. What does that mean, arguably? Arguably. What does that mean? People argue about it? <laughs> I wouldn't. You are the most famous world <laughs> paleontologist. All right, off I go. <laughs> well, thank you all. Thanks for coming out. Um, I was asked just to sort of talk about how I got involved in these movies. Um, and it all starts when I was eight years old. Um, well, it probably starts, actually I was probably born this way, but um, when I was eight years old, my, I told my father I was interested in dinosaurs, and he was a gravel guy. He, was, he dug up sand and gravel, and, and, but he had owned a ranch where he remembered seeing some big bones, so he took me out to, so I was born and raised in Shelby, and his ranch was near Dupuyer. Uh, if anybody's ever heard of that, um, took me out there and I wandered around and found my first dinosaur bone. And I had found a lot of fossils around Shelby, clams and snails and animals that lived in the ocean at the time the dinosaurs were wandering around the hills. Um, and so finding that first dinosaur bone was really cool to me. And, and I started digging up my mother's yard, um, looking for more. Um, <laughs> and, and I also started playing with dinosaurs, little toy dinosaurs a lot, and I would make the seaway and I'd make the terrain and, and really got sort of into the whole business of what dinosaurs were like. And of course, back in the 1950s, when I was doing this, the idea of what dinosaurs was like was very different. They were thought of as, you know, big, stupid, green lizards that uh, terrorized one another. Um, and and so, so that was, you know, just like everyone else, I believed that. Um, when I was 13 years old, I discovered my first dinosaur skeleton uh, near Cutbank, and it was used for a science project that I had. And so, and so I, I was very interested in dinosaurs and I, I even started a research project when I was in high school. I was interested in why the dinosaurs in Montana were so different than the ones in Alberta when they were supposed to have lived at the same time. Um, I actually never did figure that out. Um, 
It's a paper that needs to be published someday. Um, but what was interesting was um, I was out looking for fossils mostly because, because I was doing so poorly in school. Um, I had dyslexia. I didn't, no one knew what dyslexia was. My father thought I was lazy. Um, he couldn't figure out why, you know, why I couldn't pass a grade. Uh, and, and so, so I would make, be making fossil collections for our library and for the school and flunking. And so, so um, making science projects was one thing that I was pretty good at. So I did very well with science projects. And one of those science projects um, won a grand award and I was invited to go to college at Montana State University, Missoula. <laughs> For any of you old enough to know that, when I entered Montana State University, it was in Missoula. They changed the name a year later in 1965. But uh, I got to go to college and I got to, uh, even though I was flunking out, even in college, I was able to study vertebrate paleontology. And, and so I often went back to some of these areas where I'd found some of these dinosaurs and one of those areas was the Dupuyer area. And, and so while I was going to college, I was learning, I, I was flunking out, but I was also learning how to prepare fossils and how to clean them up. And so um, in 1975, I got a job at Princeton University. I, didn't, I never did graduate from college. Um, I took a lot of courses, but I failed them all, so it didn't make any difference. Um, but I got a job at Princeton University and went there and, uh, and took vacations back to Montana and would come out to these sites that I had and look for fossils. And coming back to Dupuyer in 1977, I was lucky enough to find the first dinosaur egg in the Western Hemisphere. As a preparator, no, no, I don't know what the, that's, that's nothing. <laughs> that's nothing. I didn't know what it was. I thought it actually thought it was a squash turtle. <laughs> um, but a year later, 1978, uh, my friend Bob Mackle and I were back in Montana, and we were looking for juvenile dinosaurs. I had found some evidence that, that juvenile dinosaurs might exist in eastern Montana, Juven no one had ever really gone looking for juvenile dinosaurs because no one thought you could find them. And I, it's a long story why, but it had, to do, had something to do with the difference in the dinosaurs between Montana and Alberta. But I didn't know that, and I still can't figure it out, like I said, so I don't know that it makes any difference at all. But anyway, in 1978, um, I looked in eastern Montana, we didn't find anything, and then I ended up in a rock shop um, identifying a dinosaur for a woman named Marion Brandbold. And as I was leaving her rock shop, she said, oh, by the way, do you know what these little bones are? And of course, they were the first baby dinosaurs. Um, so as a preparator, I published my first paper in the journal uh, Nature, and Princeton University gave me a raise and a promotion to research scientist. And, uh, and then I started publishing papers about dinosaur social behavior, and it was dinosaur social behavior that Michael Crichton picked up on and made a movie or a book called Jurassic Park that Steven Spielberg then turned into a movie, and Steven called me up one day and said, how would you like to work on a movie? called Jurassic Park. I hadn't read the book. Um, a friend of mine who had read the book called me up one day and said that I was in it. And of course, I'm dyslexic, so I don't read any books. And I, all the question was, was, the only question I had was whether I was eaten or not. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't. So anyway, that's how I ended up 
working on the Jurassic Park movies. Um, my job was to make sure that the animals were as accurate as they could be based on the science we had at the day. And also, as you all probably know, they aren't accurate and they weren't accurate then by any means. I told Stephen that they needed to have feathers and they needed to be colorful. And he said, feathered, colorful dinosaurs aren't scary enough. <laughs> so even though it was my job to make sure they looked accurate, it was his job to make a good movie. Basically, my job was to sit with Steven Spielberg on set and answer questions. And quite frankly, it's the most boring thing I've ever done. <laughs> I told Steven, I told all of the people that worked on Jurassic Park, I wouldn't trade my job for any of their jobs. And I still wouldn't, I, you know. They just do the same thing over and over and over again. <laughs> and what's cool, if you think, so after the movie was done, everybody wanted to come to Montana and see dinosaurs. So you know their job isn't that much fun, <laughs> right? So anyway, Jurassic Park 1, 2, and 3 had animatronics in it, uh, what we call puppets. And, and so I did a lot of work on those. But in Jurassic World, everything is pretty much everything except for one sick, dying, long-necked dinosaur. Everything else is computer graphics. And the computer graphics are fabulous. Um, but I'll let you judge. The one dinosaur in this movie that is accurate, according to me, is Indominus Rex. It is the most accurate dinosaur ever made for the Jurassic Park movies, and it's accurate because I got to design it. <laughs> Have fun, Jurassic World. <laughs>